All right, moving on to the next portion of our presentation this evening, I'd like to introduce a few very important people. Uh, the first person I'd like to introduce is that will actually not be presenting um, this evening due to a cold, unfortunately, uh, but she is uh, part of the brains behind everything you'll be seeing momentarily. Um, Dr. Masha Kuznetsova is the director of the Community Coordinated Modeling Center at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. She was a founding member of CCMC in 2001, providing researchers with access to modern space science simulations. Her research expertise is in magnetic reconnection and MHD modeling of magnetospheric dynamics, a lot of what we'll see tonight. She graduated from Moscow State University in 1981, obtained her PhD in 1987 from the Space Research Institute, and came to NASA Goddard in 1993 for her postdoc. So welcome, Masha, and thank you so much for this uh, presentation. So Layla Mays will be speaking next. Layla is Deputy Director of the CCMC at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Her research interests include modeling the heliosphere and solar energetic particles, performing model ver verifications, and forecasting space weather. She received her BS degree from the University of Maryland College Park in 2004 and her PhD from the University of Texas at Austin in 2009. And before I pass the mic over to Layla, I'd also like to introduce Dr. John Linker. Welcome, John. John is the president of Predictive Science Incorporated, a small science and technology company out of San Diego, California. He's a computational physicist with over 30 years experience in the development and application of large scale numerical models to, plot to problems in solar and space physics. He's a co-investigator on the NASA Stereo and SDO mission. So if you were at Sun Earth Day, you may have seen some of that content. And his, he and his, his colleagues first began using numerical simulations to predict the structure of the solar corona prior to eclipses over 20 years ago. So before we move over to that content, I'd like to turn it over to Layla Mays. Thank you. Um, so Alex is, uh, Alex Bach, who was introduced earlier, is our pilot um, for the open space part of this show. So Alex, can you um, zoom out a little bit of the solar system? This is all interactive and Alex is driving everything. So we're gonna talk about space weather today. And what we're looking at is the ecliptic plane that contains, yes, I'm glad people put their glasses on. Please put your glasses on, we're in 3D. <laughs> it's gonna look out of focus without your glasses. Um, this is the ecliptic plane where all of the planets lie. And so you can see their orbit trails. You can see Earth is the third trail there from the sun. And space weather uh, is ultimately produced throughout our solar system from the sun. The sun and its magnetic field controls space weather in our solar system. So we're gonna zoom in a little bit towards the sun. Um, where the Earth is about 94 million miles away from the sun to give you a sense of the scale. And we're gonna look at data from SDO, which is an Earth orbit. And we're looking at a viewpoint drawn from the orbit to the image taken. So this is an image taken by SDO in the photosphere wavelength. So this is the visible yellow sun that you all probably know um, at 5,800 Kelvin. Um, but, but the interior of the sun is much hotter. So actually, Alex, I think you can uh, turn on time a little bit faster so we can see a little bit of rotation. Um, the interior of the sun is 15 million Kelvin. It's much hotter, and that's why the sun is made up of plasma, which is not the same as the plasma that you have in your blood, but it's just an ionized gas, so the, a gas full of ionized hydrogen and helium. These charged particles, um, are flowing around in the sun, and that's actually what creates the sun's magnetic field. But there's more to the sun than what you see here. So we're going to travel through the coronal layers of the sun using the SDO data. So let's go to the next layer, which is um, at 1,700 angstroms. It's a slightly hotter temperature. 
And you can start to see little cell patterns there from flows. And then 1,600 angstroms. And you can also see a little bit of activity there in those regions. Um, as we go out, we're going to go to the uh, 304, which is the chromosphere channel. The temperature here is about 50,000 Kelvin. Um, these channels are measuring the sun at different temperatures, and we're also going out in radius. And we're getting hotter, much hotter than the photosphere. And you can hear, here we have dense plasma. You can see plasma loops, and they trace out those magnetic field lines because they're tied to the field. Now let's go to 171, which is the transition region, where the temperature abruptly jumps from uh, what we had before, 50,000, to a million Kelvin. A uh, million uh, is much hotter, and scientists are still trying to figure out why it's so hot, and in such a small distance from the sun, the temperature increases. Next, we have 193. And here you can see um, plasma at about a few million Kelvin. So we have hot active regions. You can see those regions that are dynamic. You can see a lot of the loops. You can see flares, eruptions in this channel. In fact, I'm going to take us to a quick flare. We're going to look at it on July 12th. Uh, so Alex, can you move us to July 12th? All right, there we go. <laughs> Just zoom back around. We'll, we'll see the far side in a moment. We'll come to that. Um, so we'll run this loop. This should be about a few hour loop. In a moment, you'll see. All right, there we go. So now we're at the 12th. Um, so it's skipping a little bit, but there you saw some flashes of light. So flares are intense bursts of radiation uh, from the sun, and they happen in a scales of about minutes to hours. Um, they're one of the largest explosions in our solar system, and it's a release of magnetic energy from those sunspot regions. So this is intense bursts of radiation. The loop we're showing is about three hours long. So next, we're going to go on to keep going out in, in radius. So 211. All right. Um, so it's a bit hotter here. And all these images are in false color, except for the image of the yellow sun. These are just so we can tell the wavelengths apart. So we're slightly hotter here. And then we'll go out to 131. All right, and if we can go back to that flare loop on July 12th, which when, this is when we had an extreme class solar flare that's measured in X-ray radiation. You can see that we have a diffraction pattern and saturation and bleeding in the instrument because it was such a strong flare. Now, flares can cause effects on the Earth because the light can reach us within minutes and then within hours that can ionize the Earth's atmosphere, which impacts the ionosphere. And the radio signals are reflected off of the ionosphere. So we can actually have radio blackouts in the high frequency bands. That's about 5 to 35 uh, megahertz. And so that type of effect that solar flares have on blocking radio communication is an example of space weather. So now we're going to look at stereo um, the data from a different spacecraft. So let's zoom back out to the Earth. Stereo is not in Earth orbit. It's sitting at the L1 Lagrange point just ahead of the Earth. That's 1 one hundredth the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And uh, sorry, <laughs> the stereo A and B are at Earth orbit. I got mixed up, space, my spacecraft mixed up. Um, stereo A is ahead of Earth orbit. You see it labeled there. And stereo B is trailing behind. Um, and now we're, we're going to zoom in a little bit, and we'll turn on the lines from those spacecraft towards the images that they take of the sun. So they also image the sun in some of the same wavelength as STO. And we'll just start to zoom in and fly around. And so you can see this image from Stereo B. And then we'll fly around to Stereo A. So 
For the first time with stereo, we were able to simultaneously track activity all the way around the sun. We weren't able to do that before. Um, so now we're going to project these planes onto the sun sphere. And then remove the planes so you can get an idea of what it looks like all the way around in 360. So we'll fly around a little bit more and come back to the Earth facing view. And then we're going to take a look at a simulation a simulation of the sun's coronal magnetic field lines. It's called the Potential Field Source Surface Simulation. So we're going to turn on those field lines. Magnetic field lines are invisible, so the simulation helps us visualize what they might look like if you could see them. And you can see the loops of plasma in the SDO image looks a lot like the loops in the simulation. This, is, this version of the model was from Dr. Mark DeRosa from Lockheed Martin. Um, you can also see there are some dark areas on the sun where you have more straight field lines coming out of those areas. Those are called coronal holes where you have most of the solar winds streaming out away from the sun. Now we're going to zoom out a bit. And so you have the black and white, which shows you the direction, and then the intensity is the strength. So um, those, black, those intense black and white regions are called active regions where you have stronger field, there, it's about um, a thousand, a few thousand gauss, whereas everywhere else, it's much less than that. And let's turn on the flows on the field lines, Alex. And this just, um, imagine these are arrows showing you the inward and outward directions in and out of those magnetic fields. Now let's turn off those flows and switch to the yellow sun image at the same time as this one. And you see those sunspots lie directly on those strong active region um, areas. And that's because the sunspots appear darker because they're slightly cooler. As the sun's magnetic field emerges from the surface in those active regions, that allows that area to cool slightly so it appears darker in the image. And sunspots can last days to weeks. Um, and the reason we care about these sunspots and active regions is because they can produce flares and eruptions, uh, what we call coronal mass ejections or CMEs for short. And that's very important for space weather. So let's talk a little bit more about coronal mass ejections. Um, so we're going to uh, zoom out again and take a look at data from the SOHO spacecraft. Um, that's the one I was describing earlier. <laughs> so um, SOHO, the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, is sitting right ahead of the Earth at the L1 Lagrange point, and you can see the lines drawn from the spacecraft location to those two images it's taking. So those are called chronographs. Chronographs are basically artificial eclipses. Let's slowly start to zoom in towards the um, chronograph image. Uh, there's two there. And they're artificial eclipses. They basically, you have a, a, a disk and a Kalting disk that used to block out the bright light of the photosphere so that you can see the faint outer corona and the CME. So let's turn on time and run a movie here so you can see these clouds of plasma coming out. These are eruptions of plasma and the magnetic field with that plasma away from the sun. Now it turns out that um, the moon is actually the best occulting disk uh, for the sun in order for us to see the faint outer corona. And John is going to talk to us later about the August 2017 eclipse, more about that. So we're, we're seeing the intent, the intensity of visible light from the sun scattered off of these faint clouds. So these can contain billions of tons of matter. It's hard to imagine uh, for us, but they're also traveling very fast, several million miles per hour, and they can arrive at Earth in about two to five days on average. All right, so um, next we're going to go look, zoom in a bit to SOHO and look at um, 
Actually, let's uh, take a look at stereo. Stereo also has some chronographs. And we're going to do a time sequence of the CME associated with the flare that we um, started uh, showed earlier. So we're going to turn that on. We, this is the chronograph um, from either stereo A or B. And we can see the eruptions coming out there. Um, so can we put the time loop on for the July 12th CME? All right, there we go. So we have this big eruption of material. And if we zoom out a little bit, we can see that it's coming out and it's roughly going in the direction of Earth. So with all these multi-viewpoints, we determine the speed and direction of the eruption. And that allows us to uh, run simulations. So that's what we're going to show next. Um, can we turn on the Enlil simulation? All right, and we're going to tilt a little bit just above the ecliptic plane. We're looking at magnetic field lines color-coded by velocity from slow to fast. We're going from red to yellow to white. It's faster. And then um, we can see the CME coming out there and coming and hitting the Earth. Now, the effects that the CME will have on the Earth is an example of what we call space weather. And next, we're going to zoom into the Earth. And I'm going to show you the effect on the Earth's magnetosphere. So we'll turn off the solar wind simulation and just take a look at the magnetosphere. The magnetosphere, you can fit about one sun diameter in the space of the magnetosphere. I'll turn it on in just a moment. There we go. <laughs> um, so what we're looking at here is the interaction that the magnetosphere, which is like our magnetic bubble, is created from the interaction of the sun's magnetic field and the Earth's intrinsic field, which is like basically a giant bar magnet. So it pushes it in from one side and stretches it in from the other side, um, stretches it out from the other side. So next, let's take a look at velocity flow lines. Um, and this shows you the direction of the field lines, like arrows. So can you add the velocity flow lines? Yeah, that's great. OK, um, so you can see that as the solar wind streams in from the sun, that pushes in the front, stretches out the trail roughly to about lunar orbit. And the, the part that's mushed in the front we call the nose. And in Earth radii, which is about one Earth radius is 4,000 miles, that's about 10 Earth radii. All right, so let's go over to um, look at the um, field line topology. There we go. So this just shows you how you have the solar wind field lines in green and the magnetosphere field lines in yellow. And when they push, when that's pushed in, that strips away the, the, the Earth's magnetic field lines. And that creates these red field lines that have one end connected, kind of like hair on the Earth's head. And when we have dynamic activity, you can think of that as the Earth having kind of a bad hair day. Um, so we're basically transferring energy from the solar wind into the magnetosphere and into the magneto tail, the tail on the end, like a comet tail. Um, and eventually, sometimes the tail, once it gets in a lot of energy in it, it can snap and release a large portion of it out into interplanetary space. Um, so now let's go to the event magnetosphere. And because I'm going in through these a little bit faster than we had planned because we started late. <laughs> so I just want to show a few things, but I want to jump over to John soon. Um, so the event magnetosphere, we're going to turn on the velocity flow lines on July 12th. So what we're looking at here is the effect on the Earth's magnetosphere from the CME that I showed you earlier, the eruption from the sun. And also, I wanted to mention that this model is from the University of Michigan Space Weather Modeling Framework. And so you can see that the front of the magnetosphere becomes compressed, and the tail gets really stretched out. And that can cause the geosynchronous satellites to all of a sudden be out in the solar wind. Let's um, look at the density flow lines on July 12th. And as we watch the movie play, you'll see these pulses go by as the solar wind pushes its way through. 
And all these fluctuations in the magnetosphere are basically what we call a geomagnetic storm, and that can induce currents in our power lines and cause power outages. And that's one example of a space weather effect from a geomagnetic storm. So let's change over to temperature. So we're going to color code the magnetic field lines by temperature. We're going from the cool temperature before the CME arrives. So on July 12th, and then it will, we'll be able to see that it's um, going to become hotter as after the CME hits. Looks like we lost some color. And I think we can turn off the satellites. All right, so you can see that um, it started out kind of a light blue, light temperature. And that's because, like I said, all that energy is dumped from the solar wind into the magnetosphere, so it heats it up and creates a heated environment. Um, that can cause problems for GPS as the ionosphere changes and the satellites can change their position. These are all space weather effects. And finally, we go to the current viewpoint. We're looking at the upward and downward current along the field lines. And um, these are going from the tail to the poles. And then now let's filter these down so that we're only look at, looking at them close to the poles. And now we can turn on time, July 12th, and you'll see that this, is an, this gives you an idea of the current, the charged particles that are going from the tail to the Earth's atmosphere, creating the chemical reactions producing the aurora, which is a beautiful effect of space weather that we saw at the very beginning of this program. Um, so now let's go back to where it all begins with the sun, because the sun controls all the space weather throughout our solar system. And um, the best time to observe the sun is actually during a solar eclipse. And Dr. John Linker is going to tell us all about that. Thank you, Leha. Um, so why do we have solar eclipses? Alex is going to show us right now. We're going to zoom back out and look at the orbit of the Earth around the sun and the moon around the Earth. Well, so while we're waiting for that, um, the, um, as, as you know, the Earth orbits around the sun and the moon orbits around the Earth, and we have, the moon has phases, and when it's a new moon, the moon is, um, is in line with the sun and the Earth, and it turns out when the moon is in just the right position, it can cast a shadow on the Earth. That shadow is total solar eclipse. Um, we're very lucky, actually, to have total solar eclipses. Um, it turns out it's because the Earth is, uh, I, I'm sorry, the sun is 400 times bigger than the moon, uh, <clears throat> but, the, uh, but it's also 400 times farther away. And the Earth is about four and a half billion years old. And in, in that time, the moon's orbital evolution has varied a lot. Um, and well, in particular, it's been moving away. And so it turns out there's only about 100 million years um, where you can see total solar eclipses from Earth. That's only about 2% of the lifetime of the Earth. So we live in actually a very special time. Um, so um, maybe we'll skip the... Uh, um, if you're having trouble with getting the, that part up, we could just go straight to the um, visualization of from the eclipse. Okay, we can do that. Yeah. yeah. So go to the, um, the eclipse comparison. Uh, well, there's the Earth again. Um, hey, we're just going to work out the technical glitch up here, and we'll get back to you in 30 seconds. Okay, so... Um, Okay, you want to keep on this for the moment. Okay, so now we'll actually get to see the uh, uh, shadow, I think. So first, this is the Earth. Um, hopefully, we're going to have enough time to go through everything. So um, yeah, so there you see, that's the shadow of the moon passing over the... Um, uh, uh, oh. oh, great. 
Yeah, and so that's the shadow of the moon passing over. So when you're actually at an eclipse, um, it's quite amazing. So I think we're going to maybe zoom in to uh, show you how, because when you're actually there, you see the shadow in the distance from the west coming at you, and then it passes, and, and then it passes over you. And there's really nothing quite like being at a total solar eclipse. I know here in New York you saw partial eclipse, um, and partial eclipses are really nice. Um, but there's nothing quite like when the light from the sun goes out, you see the stars, and the beautiful solar corona is laid out all across space. Um, I guess the difference between a partial and a solar eclipse is like the difference between waves in your swimming pool and watching waves crash on Sunset Beach in Hawaii. Um, so there you see that's how this um, shadow passes across you. Um, and so it's, um, wh when you're actually on the ground, it is also this kind of very amazing feeling of how this thing is coming for, coming towards you. And then all of a sudden you're in darkness. The thing I've noticed being at two totalities is that there's lots of cheering. Everyone is very happy right before, but, it, but both times when the sun actually goes dark, there's just an intake of breath. I mean, and I'm we're literally there with thousands of people, and then all of a sudden everyone starts cheering again. <laughs> so actually now let's go to the eclipse comparison. Um, and so for this, you're gonna to wanna to take your glasses off. This I'm afraid is just the 2D part, but then we'll be back to some cool 3D stuff very soon. Um, so, um, at Predictive Science, we specialize in computational models of the solar corona. We use uh, measurements of the photospheric magnetic field, which was like what Layla showed from SDO, um, the HMI instrument. We use those, mag those magnetic field measurements as boundary conditions for a large calculation that um, is w a calculation where we solve the magnetohydrodynamic equations. That's a long word. These equations are like the equations people use to predict weather on the Earth, except they're actually more complicated because they have magnetic fields in them. Um, we also don't have the wealth of data that we have, um, and so for the Earth that we have for the Sun, so we don't, can't input nearly as much data. So, um, so we actually. Developed this, our first predi our, we developed this prediction first a month in advance and then a final prediction uh, a week in advance. And the prediction was actually shown here at the museum on Eclipse Day on August 21st. What we're showing you in this fade in and fade out um, is the simulated polarization brightness. This is what, if the simulation were like the real sun, this is what it would say you would see kind of with your eyes, close to what you'd see with your eyes. In the background is an actual eclipse image um, that was taken and processed by Wendy Carlos and Jay Pasikoff. And so this is a direct comparison kind of between the thing you actually measure in an eclipse and what the simulation predicts it, you would measure. You can see that actually they correspond in large scale in many ways very well, which is good. You also see that there are um, areas where it doesn't match quite as well, and that's actually taught us some important things. If we go to the next um, slide, the, um, this is actually now an eclipse image from uh, uh, Melissa Druckmiller, Peter Aniel, and Shadia Habal. And in their technique, they actually take multiple exposures and, uh, and process them in a way to bring out the fine scale structure. That structure tells you a lot about what the magnetic field is doing. And then what we're showing you here in comparisons are magnetic field lines from our model and this uh, map of the magnetic structure. Um, the magnetic field lines are these striped things here. And on the surface is actually the magnetic fields that were measured by SDO HMI. So now let's go to the uh, um, 3D part. Let's, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna, gonna need our glasses we are, again. We are switching that. Okay, great. Um, so, um, well, today you've already, you've heard a lot about magnetic fields, and the reason why is because magnetic fields are the energy source for pretty much all the phenomena we've been talking about in this hour. And so, um, in our simulations then, um, we want, we want to be able to use them to understand what the underlying three-dimensional structure of the solar corona is. 
And so um, in a minute, what we're going to be showing you is something called the magnetic squashing factor, another big long name that you don't want to remember. We just call it Q. Um, Q is a mathematical measure of how much magnetic fields are deformed or in how their conductivity change. That's important because it tells you where they can store energy um, and how they stretch out and allow the solar wind to expand outward. So in this movie now, what you're watching then is this is the sun rotating in, before you, and, and then all of these structures are the magnetic structures that the model predicts for sun. And so the, especially these uh, large-scale um, long lines going out, and um, now we'll, I'll talk about the zooming in in a moment, and then these overlying structures, those are what are, call, are called helmet streamers. They're trapping the solar plasma. Um, when, when we, uh, um, I'll wait till we come back out to the, uh, um, to the larger scale view for a moment. There's um, also something that very important that we see here. The, these open regions are actually where the solar wind comes from. And so, um, and there's, a, there's another kind of streamer called pseudo streamers, it has to do with how they have a special kind of structure. Um, these are all the building blocks that, that, that make up the solar corona. That's really what this mapping is telling you. It's telling you, it's, it's a roadmap of how the corona is structured. So now when we zoom in, what we've done is we've changed this rendering to emphasize the lowest lying structures. This is where the magnetic fields are the strongest. Um, it's these magnetic fields that can store the energy to power the coronal mass ejections that Lalo was talking about. You also see, kind of like at the top of the sun, you'll see these dark regions. That's the coronal holes. You see these plumes coming out. That turns out to happen because there are little bits of opposite polarity field embedded within one strong polarity. And so um, all this is just a way for us to try to understand yeah. The coronal structure, which is really the basis then for um, all the phenomena that Leila was talking about. Our goal ultimately is to be able to predict this type of thing well enough, just like in weather models, that we can say what um, then what's going to happen in the future. Um, so I'll leave it with that. I will say, by the way, you can see. All, all of this at our website, uh, www.predsci.com, and thank you. Yeah, so, uh, okay, great. Um, no, I just thank you, John. Thank you, Layla. Thank you, Masha, and thank you, Alex, for steering. Uh, the software that you saw, Open Space, in the central portion, uh, if you're interested and want to check out more about it and download it uh, yourself, openspaceproject.com. So we hope that... Uh, Fans of this might uh, want to go look at that. Right now, we don't have the solar physics in there just yet, but we're working on that. So, uh, yeah, great. Excellent. I'll come down here. Did you all enjoy that? Good. <laughs> good. So also, our, um, uh, our partners that have been watching this, uh, uh, California Academy of Sciences, as mentioned, uh, Adler Planetarium. I'm not quite sure if they were actually online with us or not, but uh, I know that uh, California Academy of Sciences is. And so we're looking at uh, uh, questions. And I think Emily has uh, the microphone. And so we'd like to go into q and I'm sure you probably have several questions about what you've just seen. So um, please, any questions? Uh, we have a question up here. Wonderful. Hi. Thank you. That was fantastic. Uh, I had two questions. I was a little curious about the temporal scale of what we were looking at. So sometimes I, 
I don't understand very well if we're looking at things very sped up and also how much time of data capture is, is, is actually represented on the screen. Can you talk about that a little bit? So if you're talking about for this, um, well, I'm not surprised in some ways because during this whole hour, you heard many different time scales. <laughs> so now an eclipse observation is, on, is only for a few minutes. When I was in Oregon, I think we had about three minutes of totality. It turns out for this eclipse, though, because it was across the U.S., there was there were more um, opportunities to take images, and some of the, a lot of that stuff is still coming in. But this comparison was just for that time. We develop a model that's sort of representative of if if the sun weren't changing over some period of time. And so the rotation that you're seeing here is is something that you to actually really see would take 27 days because it takes 27 days for the sun to rotate. Um, so um, we actually compare with a lot of other observations, for example, the SDO, EUV, and things like that. Um, and so, um, but then there's a whole dynamic scale which involves, for example, coronal mass ejections, which um, the flare phase of that can be just minutes. And so those are an, another, a whole another aspect of this type of modeling. And, and of course, the magnetospheric time scales um, have their own as well. And I can tell you about this jellyfish that you might like, you know, this sea creature when we show magnetosphere. So that's probably last about few hours, five hours. But each of these little shakes is maybe minutes, 10 minutes. So magnetosphere, when it's very dynamic, in 10 minutes things changing a lot. So that's why magnetic field is shaking so fast that it can generate, you know, currents in power system. That's why uh, when it's changing, magnetic field is changing so fast. It's going to impact us a lot. Yeah, and um, that, yeah, I should have mentioned like the flare that was about a few hours, the CME about 48 hours when we were looking at those the simulations was, was days because it takes a few days for the eruption to arrive at the Earth. So we did go through very quickly and we uh, didn't quite orient you <laughs> with the time scales. Uh, there, uh, John, you mentioned last night that there are extremely energetic events where the particles Yes. Reach the Earth and how fast? Half an hour. So, for so for example, yeah. A, um, so there's the time scale for the solar wind to come out. Okay, and that um, usually days. is about four days, maybe two days or less for a very fast CME. The famous Carrington event. It probably got here in 14 hours. But energetic particles can pass. Um, they travel right along the magnetic field lines. They can um, they go nearly the speed of light, and so for example, famous event, the uh, Bastille Day event, in, was July 14, 2000. Particle, particles were hitting that SOHO spacecraft within about a half hour after the eruption started. And if you go, you can see movies of those beautiful white light pictures. They're just snow because particles are just nailing the detector. It's fortunate that. Everything survived. Well, John, John, you mentioned briefly this Carrington event. It was 1859? That's right. And, and all so, the telegraph stations burst into flame? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, was a, it was a different time. We didn't have nearly as much technology as we do now. But indeed, there were um, incidents of telegraph wires catching on fire. People, they were actually pull, turning all the power off because they thought there was something wrong. And it was actually currents were being driven in their wires. So one of the concerns why we want to understand space weather better and eventually predict it better is because that's a very unusual event. It happens probably on the order of once every hundred years. But it's actually been about 130 years now or more. So, uh, so um, more than that, I, I guess 150. So such events they, can happen. I think they saw Aurora in uh, Mumbai. At yeah, no, time. they saw it, or you, there was aurora at very southern latitudes for that. And one. they can see this flare by naked eye. At least that's what. Yeah, well, actually, I that's read. why it's famous. I don't famous. know how. Well, what's why, happened with this eye? <laughs> why it's famous, in fact, well, this, this uh, um, Lord Carrington was making observations of the sun. He was looking at sunspots, and he had, he saw what was called a white light flare, which is very unusual. It ha usually you only can see it in the EUV. And it was actually confirmed by another person as well. And then it w then literally something, you know, like 
14, 20 hours later, all this stuff started happening. And it was kind of the beginning of the Sun-Earth connection, understanding that, oh, wow, things on the Sun can really affect us. We have another question over here. Thank you all so much for coming and sharing your knowledge and experience and for making so much of this imagery public. I'm a huge fan of the space weather enthusiast dashboard. <laughs> And I really appreciate getting all that imagery. Um, I'm wondering about the solar minimum, solar maximum cycle. We are currently, is it entering into a solar minimum cycle? And the data you showed from 2012 was like after entering into the maximum. Is that correct? And what do you predict um, as a difference in either the magnetic sphere or um, the activity that should be happening? Okay. Um, well, you're right, actually. So July 2012 was right near the maximum of the solar cycle. We're heading into what is called the declining phase. We, we um, think of cycles in terms of when there are lots of sunspots or fewer sunspots. When there's lots of sunspots, actually, those are caused by very strong magnetic fields. So there's many more of these active regions that can cause these eruptions. And so that's why there's so much more activity. We're now heading into the declining phase. and well, let's just say for we're still trying to really understand how to predict solar cycles. Um, I saw a chart of all the cycle predictions for the last cycle, okay, and they basically spanned all possible cycles. So somebody turned out to be right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we really don't, I would say we think the indications are that we will probably have another, this was a weaker cycle than the previous one. And uh, we think that that will probably happen again. But um, I'm not taking any bets, so. We had another we have question a little, little over question here. here. Young man in the front row. Or I don't early. really think this is a very good one question, uh, but, um, hold on. But how, and at the end of a solar eclipse, how do you, wait, what was I? At, at the end of a solar eclipse, how do how does the moon set without you seeing it? Well, so what happens that um, when you're at a solar eclipse, what happens is long before you actually go fully into eclipse, what happens is you're seeing the sun, you're seeing the sun, and it's like there's a big bite out of it. This black thing is going over it. Okay, it's a, it's a disc. Then eventually it blocks the sun. Okay, and in fact, the last thing you see are called Bailey's beads because, and they're actually the mountains of the moon give this irregularity so that you just see these beads of light on the edge. At the end of the eclipse, you see the same thing. And that's how you know it's coming out of eclipse, which is actually important because when you're at a total solar eclipse, whenever you're looking at the sun, you have to use your dark eclipse glasses, except when you're in totality. When you're in totality, you can take the glasses off and look. But then as soon as you're coming out, you have to put them back on again if you want to look at the sun. So um, that's a very good question, actually. Yeah. Another question over here. Oh, then we have another question over yeah. here. Um, how does the moon come in the middle of the sun and the um, earth? Well, um, so <laughs> the, the earth goes around the sun like this. In fact, I, I should make Alex go back up to the booth and show it again. But <laughs> so you know, here's the sun and the earth is going like this, okay? But the moon, while that's happening, so now we just look at the earth, the moon is going around like this, okay? And then the moon, the moon has phases. So for example, when we have a full moon, it's because the moon is way, here all of the light from the sun is reflected off and we see the whole thing. Um, we see like different phases. We only see part, half of the moon, which is the quarter phase, which I know that's a little confusing, but, um, and then finally, when we have a new moon, you don't, can't see the moon at all. It's because it's right in front of the sun. It's between the sun and the earth. And it turns out, though, when it's just the right distance and in just the right space, it will cast this shadow. It will actually block the sun for small portions of the earth. So that's how you get a total solar eclipse. We have a question in the back here on your left. Hi, we saw a lot of great... Uh information on magnetic waves from the sun. Is there any information on magnetic waves from elsewhere in the, in the galaxy, particularly like from Jupiter? 
And uh, do you see some of that? Can you represent some of that? Is it any near uh, percentage of what comes from the sun? Well, um, there is actually, so in general, of course, the sun is much more powerful and things that we see are, um, are, are it, it, it overwhelms anything from Jupiter. It does turn out though, that Jupiter makes noise in the radio. It actually emits radio waves. Okay, and this was discovered, I think, in the um, 1850s, actually, or not, I, 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 no, must have been later than that. Scratch that. Carl, but anyways, Jen, Carl Jensky. And, uh, yeah. yeah. But, um, and so, um, and there's actually this interesting fact that this moon called Io that goes around actually modulates that radio emission. And it turns out it's because of this kind of complicated interactions that are like magnetospheres that, that Lilo was talking about. That, uh, why that causes that. So indeed, Jupiter does send out radio waves. In fact, generally all the giant planets like Saturn also has some as well. Um, and, um, but it's just not nearly as powerful, for example, as what radio wave, like you can get radio blackouts from the sun in one of these very strong events. So I think we have time for one more question tonight. Or do we have, do we have a question from San Francisco? We do not. Okay. <laughs> we were hoping we might have some remote questions. Thank you. Uh, do we know the reason for the uh, uh, occurrence of solar maximums and minimums? Why does the sun go through those cycles? We sort of do and we sort of don't. I guess we know that the sun generates a magnetic field, okay, because it has a dynamo. So does the Earth. The cycle is related to that generation, and we kind of have a lot of information over time. But the details of how that works are still unclear. And so we, we actually have a long record of that because, for example, people have looked at sunspots for a very long time and kept records of that. Um, so there's models of this that can kind of reproduce this, but, it's, um, but there's many aspects to work out to really understand. But the cycle is related to the generation of the sun's magnetic field. Layla, did you have anything? Yeah, we didn't have time to show you more about that, unfortunately, but um, the suns, we didn't show you the rotation. The sun rotates on average 27 days, but it has a differential rotation. So the equator is 25 days and the poles are about 35 days. So you get the shearing of those regions that we saw, those active regions, and that transports mass magnetic flux. And that's how you get the um, polarity changing and these plasma flows. And so that's the type of simulations that John was, t was telling you that people are trying to understand all the different flows that contribute to the polarity change. Any other questions? Question? Uh, do we have a microphone? Here, you can talk into my mic microphone. <laughs> Here you go. Uh, yeah. Is the information that we are receiving about those electromagnetic fields uh, helping us to understand and do better in our reception, transmission of communications to the Earth? Yeah, so I think understanding space weather and predicting space weather from the sun and how these things propagate throughout the solar system will does make a difference for improving communication. So if we can understand that the ionosphere has changed, then we can um, understand that the signal might change through that, and predicting that is very important. And magnetic field is really important. That's what differ space weather from weather. You know, it's, this term is very nice, but in weather, we're not really talking much about uh, magnetic field. But the whole, you know, universe and the solar system is driven by magnetic field. So that's why we show you so many beautiful film lines. I wanted to say one last thing about tonight's per or this evening's afternoon's program was that uh, we started working with this open space software with Masha's team, Masha and Layla's team. And we began that when we were in production on Dark Universe. And, uh, but we've been working with students from Linköping University in Norrköping, Sweden. And we've been working with them since 2002. But we began this open, open source project called Open Space back then, around uh, 2012. 
And um, the beauty of this is that uh, we're working with one of the top research institutions in the world for data visualization research. And that's where Alex is coming from, getting his PhD, and now he's here at NYU doing his postdoc. And so with this, we're now with the NASA funding, um, thanks to uh, the work we did uh, partly in visualizing the encounter with Pluto and the New Horizons spacecraft in uh, the summer of 2015, was that this enabled us to work with also the University of Utah and um, also with uh, New York University, where Alex is. And so that is bringing this to you, and you can download it, and it's free. But about three years ago, Mark Horowitz, who's a school teacher, and he's part of our, our process here in open space. He's up in the balcony uh, with his daughter, Emma. Hey, Mark. It, it's, it's that, that Mark brought me to the Brooklyn Academy of Music to see uh, Ikuo's uh, film. And, uh, and it was beautiful. Ikuo, can you join us? Come on up here. Because I really think this was yeah. an amazing film. And so the notion of having that film together with the beautiful work that John's been doing, this stunning, um, this, this, this portrait of, of the corona, I first saw it on my iPhone spinning around. So, oh, my God, you know, we got to put that on the IMAX screen. So anyway, I really hope you all in, in enjoyed that. But it's, it's this beauty of working together with scientists who can come here and explain this is really what I think makes this evening very special. I really want to thank you all. And thank you for coming. If, if, I, if I can just add one thing to that. Please. So all, all of that, what you saw today, was the work of uh, Michael Noven and uh, Oscar Kalbaum, who was, this was essentially their master thesis. Absolutely. So, mm -hmm. yes. a little shout out to them. They were, they were with you, us uh, yeah, last you, June Alan. when we did this in the dome, but we really wanted to bring this to you, the complexities that you see with all of this up here in stereo in this theater. Thanks again. Thank you, Alex, for pointing that yeah, out. Yeah, thank you, Alex.